So the next step in doing meta-analysis is that you have to select the studies and retrieve the data from including studies. So that's the, what I will tell you in this part of the course. I will first show you how you can select studies from all those uh, uh, searches you have been done in those databases. Then I will show you how you can extract and which data you have to extract from the studies you have included in your, from your searches. The next thing you have to do is that you have assess the, methodolo the methodological quality of these studies and risk of bias in those studies. So first, the selection of studies. As I explained in the uh, earlier, is that you have to save the results of your searches in files. You do that separately for each search in PubMed, PsycInfo, Cochrane database. You have to use bibliographical uh, software like EndNote or Reference Manager. It's beyond the scope of this course to show you how these software packages work, but I do advise you to use it. If you do a small meta-analysis, you can handle it by hand, for example, in Excel. But if the number of hits from those databases is too large, it's not possible to do this by hand. And you have to use EndNote or Reference Manager. One of the important issues there is that if you search in different databases, you will come up with studies that, that are included in all three or in two of them. So you have to remove the duplicates. And the guidelines for doing meta-analysis, which are summarized in the PRISMA guidelines, I will come back to that later, they require that you report how many uh, abstracts were removed uh, from your, the searches you did and how many abstracts are re remain when you have removed the duplicates. So it's very important to do that properly. It's also very important if you do these searches uh, that you document everything you do. So because you have to report this in your paper. So you have to uh, report, you have to note the date on which you, do, you did your search, the exact search strings you used, the number of hits you had for each database, the number of duplicates removed from those databases, and the number of remaining abstracts. So if you have done that, uh, you, you, you have put together the searches from those different uh, uh, databases into one uh, uh, EndNote or Reference Manager file, and you, you have to read all these, the remaining, uh, abstracts with the duplicates removed. <clears throat> the best thing to do is that if you have that list of abstracts you're going to read uh, for inclusion of studies is to do that by two independent researchers. There is evidence that if you do not do that there, there is a chance that you will miss certain studies. So it's much better to do that by two independent researchers and compare the results of that. If you have disagreements between those two researchers, you should just discuss that and see uh, when you, uh, whether you can find a solution. If you do not find that, uh, you can ask a, s a third or a senior researcher to look at this question. You have to remember that if you read these abstracts, the only thing you do at this stage is to see whether you will retrieve the full text of that paper. So it's not exactly that you are making a decision about the inclusion in your meta-analysis. You just decide whether you, uh, uh, in, you, you get the full text of that paper. So if there's any doubt, if you do not know for certain that your study may or may not uh, 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 meet your inclusion criteria, just get the full text and check the full text uh, of that paper. Um, so you have 
you have, uh, it's easy for me to say it now because it's only one sheet further, but you have been working for a couple of days and all, reading all those abstracts and titles, and you have decided about whether or not you're going to retrieve the full text of those studies. So let's say you had 1,500 abstracts. You decided that you have 100 papers you want to see the full text of, you have to wait, you have to go to your library, maybe you have to uh, get copies from those papers from other libraries because they're not in your own library. But at some point you have those 100 PDFs uh, of, those, uh, uh, of those studies that may be included in your systematic review. And when you have those papers, you can start the selection process for inclu including those studies in your meta-analysis or not. Again, you have to make a very clear list of the inclusion and exclusion criteria, and you have to read all those 100 PDFs very carefully and systematically for all the inclusion and exclusion criteria. The nice thing is that if you do that, that you also get automatically a very nice overview of that field. So you get a nice feel of what is going on, what are the issues, uh, how good are the studies. You already get that when you read those papers. So that's a, a, an interesting process in itself. Again, you, do, you, you have to do that reading of those 100 papers by two independent researchers. So uh, that's very important because the decision of in an exclusion of these uh, studies uh, is of course very important and again with two researchers and again you have to solve uh, disagreements by discussion and uh, if needed involve another researcher. So suppose you have done, you have read those 100 PDFs and you decide that you include 22 of those papers. So then you select those 22 papers and you can start with the data extraction of those 22 papers. So then you go to the next phase, the data extraction itself. So what exactly do you want to retrieve? Which data do you have to get out of those studies? Well, you have to get all kinds of characteristics of the study. You have to do quality assessment or better risk of bias assessment. And you have to data to calculate effect sizes. And all this should again be done preferably by two independent reviewers. So first, the characteristics of the studies. There is no gold rule for what you, which characteristics should be included. Probably after reading those 100 PDFs, you already have a very good idea of what the major characteristics of this group of studies is. So, but usually you again can follow the PICO acronym. The characteristics of the participants, the disorder, the severity, how were they recruited, the diagnosis, the type of intervention that is used. Uh, uh, only CBT or also problem-solving therapy and how many sessions, uh, what is the treatment format, what are, how uh, is a manual used, how were the therapists trained, how was the supervision of the therapist organized, things like that. The comparison group, so which control, which characteristics of the control group you want to uh, give in an overview and uh, which outcomes do you, uh, you want to get from those studies. This is a specific part because these outcomes are used for the calculation of effect sizes. So I'll, I will come back to that later in more detail. But there are also all kinds of other characteristics of the studies that you can collect. For example, the country where it was done, the year that, that, that the study was done, the sample size. But again, there are no definite rules for what you should and should not collect from these individual characteristics. The second thing is that you have to assess the methodological quality and bias. And I will I will, I will give a somewhat more extended presentation of this because it's 
key to any meta-analysis. So I will first say something about why this is important. I will talk about lists you can use to assess quality and risk of bias. I think at this moment the best way to assess risk of bias is the Cochrane uh, uh, risk of bias assessment tool. And I will say something about if you have done that, how, you can, how can you examine the influence of quality and risk of bias in your meta-analysis? And I will give an example of why assessment of quality is so important. And I will give uh, the results of a paper on this we published a couple of years ago. So there is a difference between quality and bias, risk of bias. Quality is quite a vague concept. It's not very clear what quality is. If you ask individual researchers, they all come up with all kinds of criteria which could be seen as an indicator of the quality of a trial. But it's, we don't have something to, where we can verify that with. So it's not very clear what quality is. And so, for example, if you look at uh, uh, the quality assessment lists available, they, they, they all differ from each other. So it, the quality also depends on the type of studies you examine. And there is no good definition of what quality of randomized trials in general is. Risk of bias is different. What you do in risk of bias is that you look at, the, at where randomized trials can go wrong. So where can randomized trials give an outcome which may not be the real true outcome? And then you, you, you basically you look at the weak points of randomized trials. Where can they go wrong? And you assess how in this trial that risk of bias was handled. And then you can get an idea of how was, uh, is the risk of bias of this study, is that high or is it low? Or do we just don't know? And that makes it possible because if you do a meta-analysis, as I said in the beginning, the, 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 the results of a meta-analysis depend on the quality of the individual trials. If there is a high risk of bias in all trials, then the meta-analysis, the, 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 the outcome may not be as certain as you would like. If there's low risk of bias, the outcome of your meta-analysis is good. So the risk of bias and validity is a key concept in any meta-analysis. It uh, defines how valuable your meta-analysis is. So uh, Moher in 1995 already identified five different scales and even more checklists for quality. And most were ba based on what, what, what the author said on generally accepted criteria. But there is no, as I said, no generally accepted list available. And I think, therefore, that assessment of risk of bias is more straightforward. And we can assess that much better in randomized trials. For example, these are some quality criteria that are used in randomized trials. And they, uh, they vary from very methodological issues. For example, in psychological treatments, uh, a quality criteria would be how the intervention was uh, delivered. Were the therapists trained? Were they supervised good enough? Is a manual uh, used? And how well did the therapist adhere to the manual? So quality is a relative thing. But if you look at sources of bias, <clears throat> that's mo much more straightforward. <clears throat> These are the biases which are used in the Cochrane risk of bias assessment tool. And if you want to assess risk of bias, my advice would be that you use the Cochrane risk of bias assessment tool. And they, they, they just indicate where can a trial go wrong. Uh, basically, and the first thing is what the, what what is called selection bias. So, and that has to do with the uh, how 
the randomization was done. So if you do not randomize properly, it may be that, the select, that there is an error in the selection of participants toward the intervention groups or toward the control group. And if the randomization goes wrong at some point, you may end up with a, an outcome of your trial which is caused by the selection bias and not by the intervention. So what you, what you do in, what you should check in the published papers is whether the sequence generation of the randomization was done properly and how was the allocation sequence concealed from the, uh, from the participants of the trial. And usually uh, it, is use, it is necessary that the allocation sequence concealment is done by an independent researcher who is not involved in the trial themself, himself or herself. Um, this is something uh, which has not been done standard in psychotherapy research until about 10 years ago when these issues came up and they entered uh, psychotherapy and psychological treatment fields also and since then you see that uh, more and more psychologists used uh, these proper methods for the randomization. That doesn't mean that they didn't do it properly before that only they, they didn't report it in their paper. So we, we are uncertain whether they did it properly or not. The second type of bias is performance bias. So blinding, that's related to blinding of study participants and personnel. That's often not possible in psychotherapy research because patients know whether they receive a psychotherapy are, are, are on a waiting list control group or they know whether they are in the therapy group or in the pharmacotherapy group. So blinding is always a problem in uh, psychotherapy research and there are no good solutions for that. Then we have detection bias, so the blinding of outcome assessors. So if the outcome assessors after treatment know to which condition a patient is assigned to, then there we see from, from research, and we've seen that in psychotherapy research too, that they are inclined to give a more positive outcome to patients who have received the treatment compared to those who received the control treatment. So it's very important that outcome assessors do not know to which condition the patient they are assessing is assigned to. Then we have attrition bias. The problem that some people do not finish the study. So if you randomize 200 people, 100 to the treatment and the 100 to the control group, not all of those 200 people will, will fill in the post-test uh, assessments. So maybe you have a dropout or attrition of about 10, 20, 30 percent. But because the random, the, it is important in the analysis that you analyze all the patients that are randomized because otherwise it would be possible that those who do not benefit from the treatment drop out from the treatment and that uh, they do not improve by the treatment and you only keep the people who uh, benefit from the treatment in your trial. So then you, you, if you only look at those who complete the intervention and the study that would give the impression that your treatment is very good while in fact the ones who didn't benefit from it dropped out and if you look at all the randomized patients uh, the, uh, the, the, the effects are probably much smaller. So what you have to do intention to treat analysis indicating that all people randomized in the beginning are included in the, uh, in the final analysis. And that's, um, you can check that in the, in the PDFs. Then we have reporting bias. So there are systematic differences between reported and unreported findings. The problem there is that there are, especially in earlier days that we have uh, uh, trials, for example, focusing on the treatment of depression. And in these trials, you use, suppose you use three 
depression assessment outcome measures. So you look at those three outcome measures and suppose you find only significant effects of the intervention on one of those outcome measures. What some researchers are or were inclined to do is that they then only report the results for that one outcome measure for which they, they, for which they found positive and significant outcomes. And they do not report the fact that they did not find significant outcomes for the other two outcome measures. So then if you use this in meta-analysis, it seems that this intervention is very effective. While it may be that if you look at if you uh, calculate effect sizes for all three outcome measures and pool them, that the effects are not that, not that good or not, even not significant. And that's the uh, uh, problem of reporting bias. Um, it's very difficult to, to assess that, but nowadays what we can do, many trials are, uh, have published protocols, so you can check the protocol, the published protocol of that study to see which outcome measures they have used and verify whether they report about that. If there is no published uh, uh, protocol, you can also look in uh, uh, trial registries because most trials nowadays are registers, registered in trial registries. And you can check in these registries. Uh, so in the paper, usually, uh, you have a number of a trial register. You can verify that in the registry and see whether they actually report the outcomes for all the relevant outcome uh, measures. Well, there, there is a, a category of other biases in the, uh, I won't go into that. You can check that for yourself in the Cochrane Risk of Bias Assessment tool. But I would say that in psychotherapy research, we have another risk of bias, which is not covered by this, uh, by the Cochrane Risk of Bias Assessment Tool, and that is researcher allegiance. We know from several meta-analyses that there are, that researchers may have a preference for a specific type of treatment. And uh, they are inclined to hope that that treatment gives the best outcomes. And we know from uh, all kinds of meta-analysis that if that is the case, that the effect sizes found uh, for these studies with researcher allegiance, that they are larger than the effect sizes found for uh, studies with, uh, uh, done by researchers who do not have that allegiance. So that, that may be something to specifically look at in psychotherapy research. So again, these are the criteria for the Cochrane Risk of Bias Assessment Tool. And if you do a meta-analysis, I would advise to use this assessment tool. These are the criteria. I, 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 I uh, uh, explained what each of them meant earlier. And uh, if you assess it for each of the criterion, you say there is a low risk of bias because it's explicitly uh, explained in the paper how this was handled and it was done properly. There is a high risk of bias. There may be a high risk of bias. So in the paper, they explain how they randomized, but that's not true randomization, for example. And what often happens, especially with all the studies, is that you have an unclear risk of bias. The paper just doesn't say anything about how this risk of bias was handled. Again, this is very important to do that by two independent researchers. And this is from a meta-analysis we just uh, 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 did. Uh, one of the PhD students in my department did it, did it. You can summarize the risk of bias of a meta-analysis in a graph like this. And you can, you can report it in different ways, so you can report uh, the risk of bias separately for each study. You can aggregate it for the whole, uh, uh, all the studies together, or you can, get, can give a graphical representation like we did here. And you have to remember this is core to any meta-analysis. The risk of bias is, the, the, the outcomes are only valid if there is a low risk of bias. So, 
how can you examine the risk of bias later when you do your meta-analysis? Well, one thing you can do is you, you can say, well, we only look at the studies with low risk of bias because they are the best studies. And if we want to have, if we want to have the best estimate of the true effect size, we will only want the studies with a low risk of bias. That's possible, but usually what you find is that the number of studies then is very small. What you can, uh, what you can also do is you can look at each of these individual risk of biases and examine them in your meta-analysis. I will show later how you can do that. What you can also do is you can calculate differential effect sizes for each for the high quality studies and compare them with the effect sizes of the low quality studies. And that's a very good way of getting an idea of how risk of bias uh, affects the outcome of your meta-analysis. What you can also do is you can use also quality or risk of bias as a continuous uh, variable, which is not really the best way to look at it, but you can examine this uh, meta regression in a meta regression analysis with the validity, the risk of bias as a continuous outcome and the effect size uh, as the uh, uh, dependent variable. I will show you later how you can do these um, uh, effect sizes. So I want to give an example uh, of this. Uh, so we, uh, we, we published a paper about uh, quality and, psy and psychotherapy in, uh, uh, for adult depression. At that point, we had 115 uh, controlled studies on psychotherapy for adult depression. We looked at risk of bias and quality criteria, which are more or less generally accepted in the psychotherapy field. And of the, we found that of those 115 trials, only 11 met all our quality criteria, which are not, which are not so very strict. Um, just normal quality criteria or risk of bias criteria. And what, but what was worse is that the high quality studies, there were 16 comparisons, so those 11 studies had 16 comparisons of psychotherapy with a control group. The effect size uh, D was only 0.22, while the, the other studies had an effect size of 0.75. And you could say, well, that's because uh, often waiting list control groups were used, which are not, uh, usually not the best quality. So if we excluded those studies and lo only looked at studies in which psychotherapy was compared to care as usual, we still found that very large difference between the high quality study and the other studies. And that the same was true when we only looked at studies in which psychotherapy was compared to pill placebo. So key points of this part is that you, if you have selected the studies for your, uh, from the bibliographical databases, you have to work through the abstracts and select the studies you retrieve full text, preferably by two researchers. You have to make a clear overview of the in and exclusion criteria to guide this process. After inclusion, you have to assess the validity of the study, the risk of bias of the included studies, which is of vital importance for the value of, the, of your meta-analysis. And if you do that, you, I advise you to use the Cochrane Risk of Bias Assessment Tool.